Yes, and did you cast your vote? Yes, I did, and good morning and happy new year to the listeners, <laughs> to the viewers. <laughs> we're, we're just about to get into March, but we can yes. take your belated kitchens. Uh, yes. What was it like for you getting to the Tally Center? What did you find? Uh, what was it like? For me, it was a pretty smooth process. I voted from up country. I went to the polling station at around 8 o'clock. I got in the queue. I went to the front. I presented my voter, that voter slip, the voter location slip, um, put my thumb in the biometric machine, received a first ballot paper, cast my vote for the presidential elections, received a second ballot paper, cast my vote for the parliamentary election. Where I was standing, where I was voting, there were only two candidates. There was, I think, an unopposed candidate, so there was no there were only two ballot papers, not three, like in every other polling station. Well, you, you make it seem like it was such a smooth process for you. It was. As we're trying to keep track of areas that were a bit problematic. Where did you vote, vote from? I voted in Chiruhura. Oh, in Chiruhura. Okay. From the look of the results, I'm assuming you've looked at the eight provisional results. Yes. And you've been keeping track from the very first to where we are now. Yes. From the look of the, la the last results we received, what is your impre impression? I think it's fair to say that the NRM presidential candidate has a steady lead. He's holding, f he's holding a steady lead. Um, I think that even looking through the parliamentary election race, I think the NRM also seems to be on course to dominate the 10th parliament. Okay. Well, I'm also going to assume you've been following the news, so you know what happened at uh, the FTC headquarters in Najanakumbi yesterday. Yes. Okay, well, um, the FTC officials held it, were calling for a press briefing, and the media went there, of course. But then we had the police uh, come in and put an end to it and say you can't hold this, and then, of course, Bestia and Muntu were taken away at a certain point. We asked uh, Pauline Amai last evening, why they would put you know a stop to this is there a law that allows for them to uh, put a stop to it on the assumption that he was going to announce results uh, from his the FTC tally center to the media and she wasn't very forthcoming about um, there being any law that would allow the police to do that maybe as a lawyer you could advise us legally only the electoral commission has the power to declare the results of a presidential election. It's given this power by Article 64 of the Constitution and I believe by Article 103 of the Constitution and by Section 57 of the Presidential Elections Act. The Presidential Elections Act prohibits, first it empowers the Electoral Commission to declare results. And it's only the Electoral Commission. And within 48 hours, after 48 hours, the Electoral Commission lands into a lot of trouble from the close of polling. So by 4 o'clock today, constitutionally, the Electoral Commission must declare a winner of the presidential election based on the results. That's the only window that it has. Now, any other person who tries to declare formally and publicly himself as the winner of, a, for example, a presidential election, would be usurping the constitutional and statutory powers of the Electoral Commission. Section 83 or 84, I believe, I didn't bring the law, I didn't know that question would be there, of the Presidential Elections Act says that whoever interferes with a process under which the Act has given, part of the election process, um, whoever interferes with that process, and then whoever interferes with it in a manner to disturb the peace, for example, commits an offense. So I think you're looking at the Constitution, the Presidential Elections Act. Th you see, the Electoral Commission is a three-tier commission. Think of it like this. You have the presiding officer at a polling station. It is only that presiding officer at the polling station, after the counting, who can then announce Result. this person is the winner. You go to the district. You cannot announce yourself at the district. It has to be the district registrar. But Alison, you're going under the assumption that um, the FTC officials were actually going to announce results. No, no, they no. did not say why they called the press briefing. No, J J Josephine, I was just answering your question. Okay. You asked me if would it be wrong, that was my answering the question, for anyone on the assumption that someone is going to declare results. Would that be wrong? I don't think that would be lawful. The people who can declare results at the polling station of the presiding officer 
at the district and then at the national tally center at the electoral commission but even them when they are declaring these results it must be an open process so for example at a polling center the votes must be counted in front of all of us and then he must declare what we all know when it goes to the district they are collecting all the different tally sheets the district must declare what has already been added what we all know when it reaches the electoral commission and so what the law does it allows for you to have agents at all those different centers for you to have agents for you to have your tally sheet so um it's for example okay for a political party to have its tally center to say we are getting all our tally sheets here and then we are going to add our votes from here but uh, and it also helps the process be so because when the, the electoral commission should also be operating in the open so as the electoral commission is declaring and announcing other people should have their tally sheets and should be able to say, excuse Compare me, notes. there is this. Okay. But, but the actual declarations themselves, you can't, for example, go to a polling station at the end of voting and then you say, I have now become the presiding officer and I have declared myself. Okay, well, so let, let me just maybe then rephrase the question. Mm. Um, the FTC did not say why they called that press conference. So we do not know if they were even intending to announce those results. Perhaps they're just going to brief us on maybe he has voted and this, you know, this is what is happening. What would then allow for the police to come in and act as they did? Okay, first of all, I agree with you to the extent that you say that the FTC were not going, we don't know what the FTC were going to do. We don't. And um, I cannot, for example, come here and say that what the FDC was going to do was going to be a violation of the law. That would not be proper or accurate. Um, so yes, I agree with you. We don't know what the FDC was going to do. From a security perspective, however, the police is constitutionally mandated under the Constitution to, pr to promote, to have law and order, to prevent and detect crime. So if the police felt that they were going to commit a crime constitutionally they have the power to prevent it but again that is an operational question and it's a question which i think should be resolved between fdc and 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 and, and the police i think if the police was violating their rights it wouldn't be correct but at the same time if the police was thwarting an attempt at illegality then uh, that is something again that um, would be resolved by both parties i don't really have all the facts on that but those are the uh, what, I, what I want to do is just place the facts before you as we have them and, and analyze them. Okay, looking at the communist era, was this not um, a situation that we can compare to then where we had the thought crimes? So this is a thought crime. We think he's going to do this, so let's act this way. No, you see, there are two things in, in policing. You have two options. Either you wait for the crime to happen or if you have enough intelligence you stop it now you say the communist era has thought crimes i think i think i wouldn't necessarily compare it to the thought crime i think the constitution of this country does empower the police to prevent crime if they felt there was going to be crime if they felt there was going to be crime but again a lot of questions about what happened i wasn't at Najana Gumbi. i really don't know exactly what happened but a lot of questions about what happened would have to be resolved around whether the police were preventing crime or whether the police were interfering with rights. And I think there's going to have to be a balance there. But I, I think to say that you should wait for someone, if, for example, you see someone is starting to climb your, is, is, is moving to climb your gate, you should first wait for him to enter the house, pick your car and drive it out. That until he has not, until he has driven the car, he has not yet stolen it. I, I don't think that that's a proper way of, of security. I think at the end of the day, um, dialogue for example between the police and um, fdc would help so that um, things can be clearer so that if for example police suspects this is what's going to happen and you say no actually this is what's going to happen then we can know are, are we being fair or unfair but i think i think when it comes to operational decisions and to things like that i think the best people really to answer that would be police and fdc yeah. however regarding the declaration of results who can declare results of an election that is the preserve of the electoral commission and i think ntv has been telling us that since polling since started. the beginning they say these and are we have results. Anyway that it we're isn't. hearing this and, and listen, that, i'm going to ask you uh, a related question yeah. the very last one i promise uh, and only because you are a lawyer it needs to be the last one on I this particular no subject yes. <laughs> since you have said we should leave that to the police um the colonial era is really where we're pushing for preventive arrest. And we've seen that happen with Besige a number of times. Is this something we should be carrying forward in these modern times? Okay, first of all, there are two questions. What's happening with Besige <laughs> and the issue of preventative arrest? 
Yes, the issue of preventative arrest is in, I think, section 27 of the Police Act and another section of the Penal Code Act, which I forget, giving the police power to prevent a person either from committing crime or a lunatic from doing something. Is that a pre-colonial, dictatorial, unnecessary provision of the law? I think that is your question. The answer, in my view, is no. Article 212 of the 1995 Constitution, which Constitution was made by constituent assembly delegates, including Dr. Kiza Besige. They sat down, elected, we elected people, the Constitutional Commission, of, which was headed by retired Chief Justice Odoki, collected views. Those views were debated in the Constitutional Assembly. The framers of the Constitution, who were representing the people of Uganda, enacted in that constitution, Article 212, which said that the power of the police shall include powers to prevent and detect crime. The prevention power of the police is therefore not just, um, is not just in Section 27 of the Police Act, but it is also in Article 212. So Article 212, you can actually say, is operationalized by Section 27. The police does have constitutional authority to prevent and detect crime, given to the police by the elected constituent assembly delegates, including, at the time in 94, one of the victims of preventive arrest. Now, is what's happening to Besige? Correct. I think... Besige has been arrested over 49 times. And preventatively, all, all of those sure. times, he's never been convicted, really. Yes. He's never been convicted. That is a fact. Is what's happening to Besige Affair was the second li limb of your question. I think that there is no question that Dr. Kiza Besige is among the Ugandans who have, and not just Dr. Kiza Besige, you and I as well, have fundamental human rights. And those fundamental human rights cannot be suspended by any person. So if at all Dr. Kiza Besige's fundamental human rights have been violated, that is not correct. However, if the police has taken <coughs> preventative action to prevent and detect crime and to promote law and order, th 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 there is a balance. There is a balance you have to make. I'll give you an example. And uh, this is not about Dr. Besiger. And I don't want, I'm not comparing Dr. Besiger to the person I'm about to mention at okay. all. I think Dr. Besiger is different. But in the United Kingdom, during the troubles, in Northern Ireland, an elected member of parliament called Jerry Adams was banned from appearing on TV or on radio. And no single radio or television was allowed to play the voice of Jerry it's Adams voice. because Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness and other leaders of what was called Sinn Féin were prevented not just from, they were elected members of parliament. They were prevented from doing anything you can imagine a person can do, including sitting in a studio, and no newspaper was allowed to say that Jerry Adams has said this and that. They went eventually to the European Court of Human Rights, but, but fundamentally, the state every now and again maybe comes in to protect public order, I don't know. But I think the contest between Dr. Besige and the police, my view on that is legally, preventative arrest is there, but if Dr. Besige's human rights are being abused, that is totally unacceptable. Do you think that was fair on Jerry Adams? No, it may not have been fair on Jerry Adams, but you must remember the period of the troubles. You see, the, the challenge of security is this. It's like going to the airport. I don't think it's fair at the airport to ask me to remove my shoes, my belt, my watch, my ring, my everything, to walk through the thing, to put my hands on my head, to, to have some gentleman touching my hips, yeah, at the airport. But if I, I recently went through an airport in a Middle Eastern country that I did not mention, and I didn't go through the hip touching, watch removing, shoe removing, and I sat on the plane and I felt very scared. So I think at the end of the day, security is not about convenience. In fact, security is generally inconveniencing. The inconvenience I had, for example, coming to this studio, coming through the, the, the gate here at Serena. So security is generally inconveniencing. I think the inconvenience to Jerry Adams was it inconveniencing, maybe even wrong. But what I'm saying is you need to balance all the interests when you're managing peace and the state. And um, 
But at the end of the day, the state should be subject to the law. The rule of law should apply, and the police shouldn't do anything to Dr. Besiger that is not provided in the law and that is not justifiable in a free and democratic society. Well, Alison, we do know that you are in a NRM leaning, so uh, let's let's not really dwell on that. But I will ask you one more question on Dr. Kiza Besije. Um We've seen that there's been a lot of disputes about how the results are coming in, the tallying and, and all of that. And we've known Besige to say before that he will not go back to court over these issues if he loses again because he's gone to court before and the court uh, comes up with the same thing. Yes, there were issues, but not enough issues to warrant either a repeat election or a cancellation of the results. Should we have um, a law that then lays it out and says this kind of mess, the, a mess of this magnitude would warrant um, a re-election, a cancellation of the votes? We do have such a law. The Presidential Elections Act. The Presidential Elections Act provides grounds on which a presidential election can be annulled. These grounds are contained in Section 59 of the Presidential Elections Act. I believe it's subsection 6, but again, I didn't know you were going to ask this question, so I didn't come with the law. The Presidential Elections Act provides circumstances. I can think of two of head. If a presidential candidate commits a single electoral offense, and the electoral offenses are, are laid out in the act, the election will be cancelled. If a presidential candidate personally, or if it is done with his knowledge, consent and approval, bribes, that is an electoral offense. And that offense by that candidate who wins an election is sufficient to cancel the election. The second thing is if there have been irregularities. The presidential candidate is not aware of these irregularities or there is no evidence to show the presidential candidate participated in these irregularities. The court will then say, okay, have they been there? If they have been there, under section 59.6a of the Presidential Elections Act, have they affected the result of the election in a substantial manner? So the first thing I want to clear, the substantiality test was not created or invented in the Supreme Court of Uganda. The elected representatives of the people of Uganda in their parliament passed section 59.6a, setting out two tests which I can think of here. There are others, but I would need the act. Number one, if a candidate has been responsible and he wins, cancel that election. Number two, if there have been certain irregularities, there must be a substantial effect. What the Supreme Court did was to give definition to the substantiality test. And it carried out two tests. The substantiality test is, is twofold. I hope I'm not boring the listeners with the law here. <laughs> well, we need to be educated. You're a lawyer. Yes. The substantiality test is twofold. It's qualitative and it is quantitative. So qualitatively, has the election been conducted substantially in accordance with the law? For example, if the law says that um, counting shall be done in the open, by and large has counting been done in the open? If you have an election where someone wins 95%, but you can show that in 90% or even in, in, in the vast majority of polling stations, we did not have the qualitative electoral process as enshrined in the Presidential Elections Act and the Electoral Commission Act and the Constitution. If all these laws weren't followed, then that election fails the qualitative test. Now, the election can pass the qualitative test but then will it pass the quantitative test? So, for example, you say that there were so many names removed from the register. Yeah? Qualitatively, quantitatively, the court will say, fine. By and large, the Electoral Commission tried as much as possible to register as many voters, but they failed. So, qualitatively, substantially, they did the job of registration. But then you find that there are 100,000 people out, and there's a 2,000 gap between the candidates. Qualitat quantitatively, the court will look at that. That's the test. What, the, what can't happen, what the, what the Supreme Court said, for example, in 2006, the majority in 2006 said that if one Ugandan is denied the right to vote, that's a violation of the law. That's an irregularity. But that does not mean that that election should be allowed should be annulled so it so you you you, you do the, the supreme the law does not allow the supreme court to unnecessarily and subjectively interfere with the decision of electors made 
at an election. However, it says if a candidate has been funny, cancel that one. And secondly, if the result, if there have been irregularities, those irregularities must have affected the result in a substantial manner. If I can make just one last point on that, there's actually nothing surprising about that. Around the world, whether you go to Kenya, to Nigeria, to the United Kingdom, to any part of the world, that substantiality test is literally embedded in laws up and down the globe. And secondly, final point on that. Before you leave that particular point, um, mm. as a law student, perhaps you, you, you're a better place to give us an example of a country where um, this particular law that you are speaking of mm -hmm. has been clearly laid out. I'll give you more than that. Very recently. Well, you could start with just that, and then we can go into the more. Oh, we have, we have Kenya, you have Nigeria, I think well, there are provisions in the UK. What do those laws say? The same, the sa maybe not the same words, but the same principle is enshrined. And what I want to tell you better than that, retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Besiche filed a petition in the Constitutional Court challenging the provisions of Section 596A of the Presidential Elections Act, which was argued by some of the finest lawyers in this land on his behalf. The Constitutional Court gave out a judgment. I would encourage anybody who is interested in these things, any student of jurisprudence, to read the judgment of Justice Lillian Chirikubinza uh, Tibatemwa, and even that was one judgment, and then the judgment of the majority. Because in her judgment, she lays out uh, dozens of jurisdictions and the provisions of the law in respect of those jurisdictions where this sort of thing happens. So it's not, you can't, there is no country in the world which says that if one person hasn't voted, you revote. There, there is always a test. There is just simply always a test. Well, Alison, could you maybe quote for us one of these rulings? I've quoted for you the decisions of the Supreme Court of Uganda in 2006, the decision of the Constitutional Court of Uganda in 2016, all of them looking at the law. The, the principle of substantiality was enunciated, described, and gone into in great length by the judges. The reason why I want us to go uh, away from the Ugandan issues because we've had lawyers before come up and question this particular law that you have said is, is, is clear. So um, we've had them question it and say it's a grey law, it's, it's, it's not very clear. And that's why I would like you perhaps to help us quote a ruling from another country. In Kenya, just in Kenya, the decision of the Supreme Court of Kenya, the majority of 12, to zero, I think 12, I don't remember the numbers, in the Raila Odinga petition. In Ghana, the Matama, um, the, the, I forget the name of the candidate, but the petition in Ghana recently challenging the presidential election results in Ghana. The petitions in Nigeria, including petitions filed by the current president of Nigeria, challenging election results. Not only that, municipal and parliamentary elections in the United Kingdom, dozens of decisions quoted and cited in, 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 in various instances. The decisions election decisions have been challenged. I mean the most famous presidential election petition of course is Bush and Goa, but we're not going to Bush and Goa. But the, the ones in Kenya, the ones in Ghana, the ones in Nigeria, the ones in Zambia, the ones that's just 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 that's just in Africa. I've told you the various decisions the, the principle comes from various decisions in the United Kingdom. And what why I'm why I'm quoting the Ugandan judgment is because in fairness to the justices of the Supreme Court of Uganda, they didn't just say, this is section 596A, we are going to do this. They went into great length to bring other jurisdictions, dozens and dozens of jurisdictions where this happens. But I, I just want to say one other thing. The election petition is a petition where the Supreme Court of Uganda sits, uh, again, I'm again going to have to apologize to people who don't follow, who, do, who, who are not lawyers, but... <laughs> well, if you could try to take away the, a lot of the legal, the legal language, language, then it would... Uh, I, will try, I will try my best to say, it's a, what do you call, what do you call it? It's a problem of the trade. We, we say complicated things. But um, the Supreme Court of Uganda is a Supreme Court. Every time the Supreme Court is sitting, it's really looking at disputes about the law. It sits as, a, as an appeal court from cases which come from the Court of Appeal or from the Constitutional Court. And usually by the time you, you establish the facts in the lower court, and what you are going to really be establishing in the Supreme Court is the law. It is only in the presidential election petition where the Supreme Court sits as a court finding out the facts. It sits as a finder of fact. Now, is the substantiality test different in the election petition than, for example, in defamation? Because defamation, I think, is a law that I'm sure you're, we're, we're you're well acquainted with. Yes. Josephine, if you came on this station and said something about me that isn't true 
it's not necessarily defamatory. If you come on this station and say that I have a lot of hair, that is not defamation. Defamation must lower my estimation among right-thinking yes. members of the society. It is not enough to just lie about me. If I took you to court, to, for example, for example, if I took you to court and, uh, and said, she said, I'm bald-headed yet, I'm a man blessed with vast resources on my head. Has that allegation lowered your estimation among right-thinking members of the society? A court finding the facts is then going to have to inquire into the substantiality of the defamation. In each and every case where a court is finding fact, the substantiality principle emanates through. So, for example, if you say that um, they said um, that you are a very rich man because you own a hotel, and you say, no, I don't own a hotel, I own a factory, you have not been defamed. They have lied about you. You have been defamed if I said you were a thief and you were not. Yes, because the moment okay. you say I'm a thief, you have lowered my estimation among right-thinking members, members of society. Well, Alison, just one more question in, in relation to this. We know that judges, are they argue, um, they, they, they make their decisions really basing on the arguments in court from both sides. Yes. Is there um, a situation where, should they look at external circumstances uh, at, at a certain time? For example, if um, in this case they know that to go back to uh, let's say have a re-election on this uh, in an election mm -hmm. and then they know that if we have a re-election we might have a uh, cases of violence come res as a result of that a good, a good. Would, yes do we have should we have um, instances like that okay what do they look at i think is the first question and the second question is do they only look at the evidence or should they look at external circumstances external circumstances actually in the presidential election petition, the court was very, very liberal. To even conclude that there were irregularities, the court had to bend over backwards, had to be very liberal with regard to the evidence which came in. For example, the court took um, some observer reports to say, okay, this observer said this, we're going to believe him, without the observer swearing an affidavit. In any other case, you'd have to have a higher standard of, of, of bringing forth the evidence. The court looked at uh, affidavit someone says i was beaten by ellison and ellison swears an affidavit says i was i didn't beat him in any other court they'll say you need to bring there's an allegation there's a denial but f for the court to have concluded that there were irregularities they weren't they were not they were not as strict on on the evidentiary rules so the, the court looks really into the broad spectrum but does the court look at whether or not there will be chaos i think the law provides any other external circumstances or any other external circumstance i think oh i think the law fundamentally of course practically there are those who say the law is what the judge says but legally strictly speaking legally the court must look at the conditions for the annulment of an election which are set out in the law we must not the judges must not legislate from the bench. They have not been elected. Ugandans have gone through a lot of trouble to elect members of parliament. It is those people who they have entrusted with the power to legislate on their behalf. And if parliament has said these are the conditions in which an election should be annulled, the courts cannot say, okay, all the conditions have been met, but I don't want because I think that X, Y, or Z. The, the, the Supreme Court shouldn't rule the way they voted. Okay. They, they, they should rule based on the evidence. Because the moment it becomes subjective, you find people ruling the way they voted. Someone stood in the line, voted for you, you appear before him, he shouldn't rule the way he, the way he voted, or even if he didn't vote, the way he would have voted at an election. He, he doesn't get a second chance to cast a ballot. All right. Well, Alison, um, I'd like us to move on to the parliamentary elections. Yes. Have you been following them closely? I've been following them very closely. I've been following what you tell me about them. <laughs> I, I, I sit on the other end of the screen and I've been seeing what you're saying. Thank you so. for watching NTV. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we've seen has been uh, quite a number of young people coming in. Mm. Do you think this is good for us as a country? I think we had a very young parliament before. When? The, 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 the ninth parliament. The I ninth think pa had an average age of maybe 45. I just need to be corrected on that. It was a young parliament. I think this looks like a younger parliament. Uh, I think energy levels will probably be good. Um, maybe. Will it make Parliament more vibrant? Will we have um, better decisions made when it comes to policy? I think Parliament always has that mix. It has vibrancy. It has, on occasion, very rarely, of course, 
comedy and then it has a lot, m most of the time of course, it has a lot of gravitas and seriousness. I, I, I believe the 10th parliament will continue to feed us with that same broad mix of seriousness, of gravitas and of comedy. If you could summarize for me in, in just one sentence yes. your thoughts on the 9th parliament, what, do you what did you think about it? I think there was room for improvement. Okay, well, like most, many other people think that they started off with a lot of energy. They were very, very bri vibrant, they were energetic, and you know, we, we, we saw, we thought that this would be the parliament that would, you know, change the way things were. But by the end, they seemed to have, uh, we, we don't know what happened. Do you think the same could play out with the 10th parliament? Like you've said, it looks like a much younger parliament than the previous one. Don, don we have right in terms of vibrancy of course certain things happen in a parliament i mean in the first two years of a parliament you have a lot of new people establishing themselves and coming in in the last two years of a parliament they start getting opponents in the constituency and they have to go back and protect the tough i think that trend of parliaments across will continue to remain in the 10th parliament but i think what we need to understand about parliament is we do not just want our mps vibrant we want them better informed. We want them better educated. Parliament shares power. It is Parliament governs. By better educated, I, I would like I mean to ask you this. Uh, well, we could debates. also look at the better educated, um, the idea that the MPs that are going in, they, they come and they, they don't really know much about, you know, what's happening in there they go change their minds you know today it's one decision the next it's another if they go are called maybe by the president they come back and they've made they've changed the decision that they had already made but we're going to have that discussion um i'd like to uh, head on to patrick kamara who is standing by waiting to give us an update patrick thank you very much josephine karungi and thank you very much elson um what we've seen is very exciting and, and elson talking about new uh, members of parliament who are coming in. I mean, it's going to be very exciting considering people like Simeo Subuga, who has, has just come in, people like Judith Nabakova, Judith Bavirie, Kato Lubwama. Uh, you, know, you know, you, so. you, you take away Ken Luchamus, you bring <laughs> Kato Lubwama. And, I mean, it's going to be very exciting on, on that angle. And of course, the, mem the people of Uganda have shown exit to the long-standing MPs. This has been like a political hurricane, if you see what has happened in Western Uganda and in, and in Northern Uganda. Long-time serving ministers have gone. You know, Energy Minister Maloney, gone. You know, people like he, with the General Kahindo Tafire, he's a Bush war hero, gone. Even though now it's being disputed that um, uh, Dr. Crispus Kiyonga probably he's not gone or gone. We are yet to, to know, but at least the provision results shown that he had go he's gone. He had so, issues. Yeah, sorry, he's gone? I, I, no, I said he had issues. He had issues, yeah. You see, well, there are those who are bouncing back a little bit and after meeting and stuff like that. But I think the people of Uganda have spoken and uh, we, unequivocally about uh, their leaders. It appears to me that whereas President Museveni was able, um, according to the numbers, to, sh to show us that he's still at 6 to 1, maybe he speaks the language they understand and, 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 and his political um, uh, character, character, character characteristics is not um, infectious to the other uh, politicians in his, what, in, in his group. But let's just try to look at what is happening. Uh, I'm going to put you on the wall so that I show you the numbers. And um, this is what is happening. Um, for example, uh, if you go to uh, Abed Bwanika, Abed Bwanika has 70,708. These are results, by the way, from 21,254 polling stations. And uh, this is according to 8th provisional results that were released by the chairperson of the electoral commission so that's where dr abed buanica uh, stands and by the way dr abed buanica is closing in on uh john, john patrick amama babazi and if this was a premier league kind of football this is what you would say that uh, amama babazi and buanica beno Nibiraro are in a relegation dog fight you know, so many months ahead before even the close of the season. So Amama Mbabazi is 112,071. This, this, this also from 21,254 polling stations that have been tallied. And Professor Vanessa Bariamreba, who is an independent candidate, has 42,093. 931,000 representing five zero point five 
0.58% of the votes. And by the way, Amama Mbaba's percentage is 1.50, while Abed Bwanika's percentage is 0.95%. Uh, and when, if we move on, we'll see that uh, General, Major General Benin Buta Biraro is that uh, of the farmers part of Uganda has polled 20,553 votes and uh, that is representing 0.28%. 0.28%. And all these uh, contenders, apart from uh, Dr. Bess J and President Museveni, they don't even make a total of 4% so far. L and moving on, Maureen Chalia is at uh, 32,773, uh, which is representing which is representing 0.44% of the total votes that uh, she has so far garnered. And, and moving on, we see Dr. Kiza Besije of uh, the Forum for Democratic Change, you know, who is coming close second uh, to President Museveni with 2,603,880, which is representing... Uh, 34.94 so if maybe we get the other results provisional results maybe dr Bessage is going to improve and uh, go to 35 or 36 remember in the previous results of uh, the presidential elections in 2006 i think dr Bessage reached around 37 uh, percent there's a likelihood that you could reach that mark or even or even go ahead of it because so far we have results from 21,254 polling stations, which is just like 51% of the, of the tallied, and 49% are yet to be tallied. We have uh, Joseph Mabirizi with 19,661 votes, uh, which is, uh, which is 0.26% of the votes that he has uh, so far garnered. So it is just a two-horse two race between President Yoweri Museveni and Dr. Kiza Besije. And these have come from 51% uh, percent of, of the tallied uh, polling stations. 49 are yet to. And if the, by the end of the day, because the Electoral Commission has 48 hours within which to announce the winner. And by 4 p.m. we should be getting the winner of this presidential race. Uh, by... It's things are likely to change. Is President Museveni going to go beyond 61 or come to, to 59? That we are yet to see, but indications are that Dr. Besije has been increasing his numbers and Museveni is staying at 61. But of course, the remaining 49 uh, pers percent um, polling stations, which are yet to bring in their results, can determine uh, the figures to go either way, down or upwards, for whichever candidate that, that, that uh, will have. Uh, convinced the Ugandan voters more than the other. So this election again has shown from the from the start when we went to the polling um, on polling day, we saw big numbers of people coming to cast their votes. The many people said that maybe this was going to be the moment in history when we could see things change. In fact, it has been a moment in history for many because when you see the 19 ministers uh, in the NRM that have lost their positions, for them, that is an end of an era and the beginning of another. But for President Museveni and Dr. Besije, we don't know whether this be uh, whether that, that era seems not to be changing as of now, but of course there are going to be a lot of questioning. We've had now the, the observer missions, especially I've just been listening to the Comesa observer mission, who's already said that the, there was fairness, transparency, and uh, but again he said the Electoral Commission could have done better by uh, you know relaying the results faster. Also, um, the challenges that they had, especially the technical challenges, could have been avoided and, and things like those. But they continue also to give updates of what they have seen. Well, of course, they will be giving us a conclusive. But one thing we have to remember, that the AU leader of the observer mission, Lusa, General Lusa Gonoba Sanjo, at least for him at the very beginning, said um, the delay in Kampala, in Wakiso, and some other areas of about seven hours, eight hours, was inexcusable. That you can delay maybe for 30 minutes, maybe for 20, for an hour, but from, uh, for seven minutes, for seven hours, especially from the Electoral Commission to the 
a street industrial area around Namuongo. Uh, for, for, for him, he said that was a bit uh, difficult to comprehend, and in some countries it is an inexcusable. But this is where we start, we, we look at, if we look at the, the real numbers of uh, the votes that they have so far, uh, President Yoweri Museveni has 4,549,148 votes. That, those are the total votes so far he has received. And, and, and you can see the graph is just moving on, the yellow graph is moving on uh, upwards. Whereas his, I don't know whether to say main challenger, but yes, he's the main challenger, uh, retired Colonel Dr. Kiza Besije. Uh, this graph is right here, showing us 2,603,880. And, 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 and if we came to, uh, to Amam Mbavazi, uh, Mbavazi's graph is right down there. And others, you can't even see anything coming out. People like uh, Mabirizi. Uh, people like uh, Kialia, Baria, and, and Viraro. Mbabazi is right here. Buanika and Mbabazi seem to be uh, in a, uh, closing on each other. Closing on each other, and uh, uh, yet Mabirizi cannot be seen. But let me take you to a, a chart here so that you can maybe have a, a feel. This chart represents the polling stations that have been tiled. So the one in blue uh, is showing us 21,254. Uh, tiled polling stations representing um, 75.8% 75, 75 and then these are the, the pending polling stations which are 6,758 uh, that is 24.8 24.12% that are pending and uh, right here we have the, the, the numbers and the figures of the, of the, of the candidates on how they have sc scored. Yoweri Museveni with over 4 million, uh, Dr. Kiza Besije with over, uh, maybe let me bring it here. Dr. Kiza Besije with, with 2,603,880, which is 34.94% of the votes so far he has received. And uh, President Yoweri Museveni with the 4 million, 549,148, which is 61%, 61.05% of the votes so far he has garnered, and others are at 298,000. The, these are the invalid, let me take you to the invalid, invalid votes, uh, I think, which is going to be an issue, uh, I suppose, because we have 371,000. 371,012, which is representing 4.74% of invalid votes. And if you look at 371,000, I'm talking about a population probably of an entire uh, city or an entire uh, uh, town or municipality like Mbarara, like, like, like Gulu municipality. Uh, maybe it doesn't even have such a number of people. 371,000, imagine people in all that town, or two of them, their votes are invalid. So I think that will be an issue uh, for people to, 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 to ask questions about or to find out how those vo votes uh, were involved. And then the, the voters so far told are 7,822,737. And uh, out of 15 million voters, 294,070. So what, what, which, which means that for so far, 51,000 um uh, 51 percent 51 percent uh, 51.15 percent of, of the votes of voters so far have of the votes have been told so so that's what that's that's what we have from 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 the electoral commission and i'm sure in the next one hour or two they'll be giving us more and before before 4 p.m would have known who is the next uh, head of state and commander in chief that ugandans have decided to choose in this general election decision 2016 um that that's how it appears to be going but 
uh, one thing we know that for sure, that we're going to have a parliament with the new faces, uh, older ones seem to have gone. There are those who have been with President Museveni for more than 30 years, or even 35. People like uh, the Honorable Mugano Kajura from Bunyoro, uh, who, is, who have been shown the exit. We have new members, people like Sylvia Rwabwogo, who is coming in from Fort Porto Municipality. And, 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 and we have people like Ingenia Muloni, who uh, the people of, of uh, in, in, in the Bugiso have decided to say, you know what, maybe you have to try again. Um, it's quite an, an interesting scenario in 2016 to see how Ugandans have uh, changed change, change their, change their leaders. So um, that's, how, that's how it is, maybe. Well, Patrick, just before you get into the parliamentary elections, um, from what you've been telling us and showing us on the screen and from what was projected even before um, these elections started, I know a lot of people are saying it's going to be a two-man race, uh, Dr. Kizabes and President Yuri Museveni. How is it, I was discussing this with Ellison while you, you were talking, uh, how is it that we still have Ugandans that it's just still a two-man race that we have President Yori Museveni and Dr. Kiza Besti, and even when we saw Mamam Babazi come in strong at the start, somehow the race continues to be between two people. I think maybe the media and other people, maybe we built the bubble <laughs> of the Honorable <laughs> John Patrick and Mamam Babazi with all respect, because even the, the polling op the opinion polls show that maybe he would be Ghana more than what but remember this is just provisional so more probably he can change all of a sudden but 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 i think you need to have your brand known you need high name recognition across uganda and, and and when he first went to northern uganda remember he was uh, apologizing for not have not having visited northern uganda when he was the prime minister probably that also affects but what president museveni immediately after the election you'll find him going back into in rural areas, we are meeting the people. So for, if you're doing that for four, five years, really, it gives you visibility. It, it gives you, your brand, your brand is known. So, but for you to build your brand like a mall in Chalia, so that everybody in Uganda, from Vura in the Northwest, to the hills of Virunga, from Kotido to Kases, everybody knows you. It's a Herculean task. You need to have the money, you need to have the resources, you need to have the structures. But we were to told Mbarazi had be there. the money, so yeah? where was the problem? You know, we talked about the money, but the really, <laughs> but did the money come? Uh, probably, <laughs> and was it enough? You know, they have been, they, they say that he was, he was projected as a man with a lot of money. But probably, that was not true. Probably, we, we could have goofed for whoever said so. And probably that was uh, his rivals who wanted to show him as a man of money, and yet the money was not going to be there, and then he looks bad. Uh, so, I think many people, I'm sure now, have to eat their humble pie on what they <laughs> said earlier because things have changed. Well, Alison, could you share with us what your thoughts are that this is still a two man race? Uh, how many years, uh, elections later? Yes, I think um, there's a bad part of it and there's the other part of it. I think um, many people think that um, um, the that the politics is now ha has two parallel lines, people who will never meet at any point to agree as, as opposed to so it's like it's like U-shaped politics, you know. You've got this small little middle and two parallel points, as opposed to a bell, where while the the center is what holds, sometimes it moves left, it sometimes it moves it moves right. But the other hand is, I think the big challenge that Honorable Mbabazi faced, and that um, we are going to see many people face for time to come, is you really need the support of an organization. I think. I think um, a presidential election is about an organization. It's about structures. It's about a party. I think the strength, uh, President Museveni uh, looks, looks look, they didn't look on course to win today. They didn't even look on course to win with opinion polls. He looked on course to win with, with unopposed people up and down this country, with 10,000 NRM people being elected unopposed from LC3 up to parliament. I think if an organization simply has in all parts of this country, 10,000 people already in positions working for a victory of one person, it becomes, uh, people, other people don't even have 10,000 votes uh, in the whole country. These people already had 10,000 elected leaders. So I think you, an organization is something that is fundamental. I think the whole idea of independentism at presidential level may, may be overrated. Work. So ideally the, the candidates we see with organizations that would be then the FTC and, and the, the NRM. NRM. And at one point in the earlier, much earlier years we had the UPC but somehow... You see, you see, you see, you see what happened with UPC and DP is that in 2001 they gave their organizations 
to Dr. Kiza BCJ. I, I saw that they tried to sell them again. I, I'm sorry to say this. I, I saw they tried to sell them again to an Arab mama and Babazi, but basically had already taken them. So when they sat, for example, in, in, in the TDA summit, you had BCJ sitting there with 30% uh, already of the country that's go going with him, and then a number of zeros who came together and said that they're the majority and they've chosen the zeros so that they were more than the 30, it, 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 it simply couldn't work. Oh, Patrick, another thing that um, we noticed while you were showing us those graphics was that the invalid votes were 371,000. Yes. Amama Mbawazi had 112,000 yes. votes. The invalid votes were more than Triple. his votes. Votes for all the can other, other contenders, apart from Dr. Bessie General 7, the combined. Yes, and then let's again, combined. also the spoiled votes. The spoiled votes were 22,046. Yeah. That's still quite a huge number. How it's is it that we have invalid votes of that number and spoiled votes of that number? I think maybe it will come down to civic education. And uh, they'll say maybe people did not know what to do. Uh, they didn't know how even to tick or something like that to cast their vote. I mean, maybe they, they were not educated enough uh, to behave in a manner that would make sure their vote is uh, cast in the right way and it's not invalid. But the numbers, 371,000. That's quite If you look, I don't think there is a municipality in this, in, eh? I don't think there is a municipality in, or town in this country that has such a big number. So ideally we have and three so candidates. We, so you have, yeah, in, the invalid, invalid votes are like that. the third yes. candidate. <laughs> the invalid votes. If you look at the numbers, they're like the third candidate. Shouldn't that worry us? It should, and I think, it will, I think the, the Electoral Commission will have to maybe explain how this uh, came about and how do you solve something like that? Because if 371,000, let me paint a picture. Nambole Stadium sits in about 40,000 people. Wow. 40,000. So we have so you, so you have <laughs> about uh, eight Namboles, all the people who went there who can fill in the eight Namboles stadiums who have just goofed in the polling in the po on polling station. That's how That's it is. It's quite a waste. <laughs> That's what we That's, yes, yes, Alison. I think if you look at those numbers, they are, they are worrying because it does, uh, that's an average of about 18 invalid votes per polling station. That's 18 people have lined up in that scorching sun to give invalid votes. I think there's a problem there, and I think. There may be two problems. I think the first problem is civic education. But I don't just think it's of the voter. I would really want to see what an invalid vote Look like. looks like. Or what's the difference between an invalid vote and, and a spoiled, spoiled vote. We had the Electoral Commission uh, assure us uh, at the very start that they had the people go out and sensitize the people and show them how they were going to vote, what to do, how to work with the biometric system. But this is not an indication that this was actually done. Maybe the problem may be polling officials. Maybe they're declaring valid votes. In, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to make any allegations. But I think it's a number that really needs investigation. You cannot have 18 people, 18 people voting invalidly. And then if you add on the spoiled votes, then it's something that says you can't have, what he said, four numbers. Filled with people. Filled with wrong votes. voters. <laughs> No. All right. Um, we're expecting to get an update from the Electoral Commission from the Nambole National Tally Center. But as we wait for those results, Patrick Amara will be taking us to Nambole shortly. I'd like to continue briefly with our discussion of um, the parliament, the, the 10th parliament that, that is to come in. Um, do you think, looking at the, the people that are going out, and they're quite, um, they're, they're the older group, do you think we would need a few members of the old guard to stick around and and perhaps advise the new people coming in or, or, or is it do we just need fresh blood i think that the strength of parliament is in its diversity and in its diversity not just in age in the diverse in the diversity of experience and i think we are seeing I think, I think Parliament is a good mix so far, what we are seeing. We are seeing engineers coming in. We are seeing former civil servants. We are seeing former police spokespersons. We are seeing um, uh, actors and comedians. We are seeing musicians. We are seeing traditional politicians. I think that the debate in Parliament, once you have a mix not just across age groups, not just across gender, not just across ethnicity, but once you see uh, 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 so many different skill sets. I, I mean, um, 
once you see so many different skill sets together with the skill set of your traditional politician, uh, I think that well managed, well led, and um, with proper information coming to the house, it balances it, it has very good potential. Uh, let's use an example from the United States. John McCain, he's been a senator for over 40 years, mm. holding the same position. Um, do you think there's, there's value from having people that are, I mean, we, we see that Ugandans frown upon seeing very elderly people in Parliament because they, you know, they're dozing during these things and, and, and we seem to judge them on their performance when the budget is being read, uh, the mm. nation, <laughs> when uh, President Museveni is giving the State of the Nation address. Mm. Do we need them staying and holding these positions? I think there's nothing wrong with having old, experienced people occupying public positions and informing us on public debate uh, because they have the advantage not just of experience but of history. I think you, you definitely see a lot of history. I mean a man like John McCain would for example be fully aware of Uganda's, of, of okay. America's yes. foreign policy. He may have sat on the same committee. He may have gone through very many different administrations of presidents of the United States and there's a lot of value he can bring. He can bring. But this age is age is not is not the only value that we should um we should um, be looking at. I think personally I think that the wide spectrum of different life experiences when you go into the house, if people have the humility to learn about parliamentary practice and procedure and how governments function I think they bring a, a vast range of different experiences to the house and I think what is most important is not just different ages but we are seeing someone who worked say, in UNRWA, someone the who worked in the private sector, bring. someone who worked at, at the National Theatre, someone who worked uh, <laughs> at uh, well, wherever. Thank you very much Ellison for Great. taking the time to speak with us. Let's uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Patrick to take us to the National Tally Centre in Nambole and right after we get the update from the Electoral Commission we'll have our Luganda team coming to update our Luganda audience. Patrick, over to you.